Hello, my name is Stiley Hayward. I would like to welcome you to the Blessed Hope Ministry. We are a King James Grounded Family Bible Study. These lessons are not to be a substitute for regular church attendance. Nightly, I direct my family through the Bible by chapter and verse. We request you to join us and to study from God and His Son, Jesus Christ. You may have permission to like, send, or encourage our studies with family or friends. Edification of what God has and what He desires in our life. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. You may use our studies, but I request that you do not abuse them. For YouTube videos, subscribe below for more videos. And place the thumbs up and leave a comment or email me. Thank you. As we pick up in the book of Philemon, we read verse 7. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of, thy, of the saints are refreshed for thee, brother. What does our Christian lives do? What are they supposed to do? What does your average Christian think that his life is supposed to be? Is it supposed to be for self? Or is it supposed to be for others? It encourages, or it's supposed to encourage, other Christians to keep going. Keep doing right. It should, but most do not. Characteristics of our lives is to be for others to keep going. The trials and tribulations that God gives us may be encouragement for someone else. That as we are marching to the victory, I have finished the fight, I have fought a good fight, pressed toward the mark, and we keep going. Might be examples to someone else who's going through troubles to keep going. Paul is being rewarded by a fruit of the Spirit being in jail by the testimony of a Christian. He's in jail. He's bound. He has no freedom. And yet here is a man encouraging him and not bringing him down. Not, oh, woe is me. I ought to give up. I have seen what WWJD, what would Jesus do? But what about WWPW? And you say, what is that? What would Paul write? And you, you say, well, what is that about? What are you talking about? What would Paul write? If Paul knew it about the Church of America in 2017, what epistle would he write to America? It's written to seven churches. Uh, seven, yeah. And Timothy, and Titus, Philemon, maybe Hebrews. Corinthian church is a carnal church. If Paul was living today, and by the Spirit of God, Paul, I want you to sit down and I want you to write an epistle to the American churches. What would he write? What would be the state? What would Paul write about you? If you were to write a letter, an epistle to Philemon, but instead of Philemon, what it would be you or me? What would be our strong points, if any? What would be our weak points, many? Are we helping? Or are we destroying? What epistle would he write? What if Paul was in prison? And he is. And the apostle came to him with a report of us in the States. Paul's in jail. An American Christian came to Paul in jail. And Paul's, hey, how's it going there in America? What is your report? Could that gentleman say to Paul, and could Paul say, for we have great joy?
What is the testimony that we hold? And not only as Americans, but as individual Christians. This book is written to an individual Christian. Verse 7 is written to Philemon. Consolation. Again, remember where Paul is. He's in jail. The 1828 Webster's Dictionary states comfort. Distress of mind. Refreshment of mind of spirits. Paul got glory from the lives of Christians doing right, even in jail. Do you support a missionary? Is your conduct supporting that missionary during his trials and tribulations that keep going? That took the minute... That took the ministry out of the jail. It was what kept him going. He wasn't in jail. Man, he's living for Christ and hearing that everybody is doing right. One of Paul's joys was a fellow or fellow Christians. One, Philemon. That was his joy. He said, what is my joy and my crown to one of the, to the churches? It's you. The soldier on the battlefield longs to hear good news. Any news from home. He doesn't want to hear that his wife has been sleeping around. Commit adultery. He doesn't want to hear that. He doesn't want to hear that his child may be in a hospital. He doesn't want to hear that his mother is on a deathbed. He doesn't want to hear that his hometown has been destroyed by a flood. He wants to hear good news. And Paul loved to hear about men and women serving God. He don't care about men or women playing base baseball. He doesn't care about men and women acting up on a stage or a movie screen. He doesn't care about anybody involved in sports. He doesn't care about what you did this weekend unless it is to the honor and glory of God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. And he even told the Corinthian church, listen, I just want to know what about Christ. I don't care about the other nonsense. I don't care what your life goals are. Unless they focus around God and Jesus Christ. I've been in churches where it's sports. It's the movies. It's these books. Where, and never God and Jesus Christ. And I've been in churches where I, I speak for God. I speak for Jesus Christ. And I'm the oddball. Something wrong with that. Where there was trouble, he took charge right away and addressed it. Especially the Corinthian. I mean, like I said, see First and Second Corinthians, the letters. That did not please him. Second Corinthians said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm not sorry for that writing this letter, but I am sorry. And with tears, I had to write First Corinthians. I don't like when you're not doing right. I don't like it. Like a parent with a child, you don't... And, they don't like having to, to punish their child. They don't like having to correct their child. It hurts. And yet it must be done. I'd rather give a child a, a cupcake that they've done something good than a spanking. I'd rather give them something for doing right than have to take away for doing wrong. No one rejoices that, oh, yeah, there goes my son in handcuffs in the police car. Who rejoices over that unless you're sick? And what stands out in Philemon? Faith and love. Now, people can go to stores. They can buy all the love plaques they want. They can get all the scripture signs with, with faith. They can nail it to the walls. They can put it on their pillows. But are you living faith in love? Is it a verb in your life? Or is it just a bunch of monograms? Is it 
penciled out, crayoned out, painted out, sold out. I mean, so as a needle and thread, or is it your life? Is it something that is in your heart that people can say that's love and that's faith? No, he, he's got he's got curtains to say faith and love on. Well, what about him? I don't know. I don't know. Just in the curtains. No one could name or write a bio. No one could name or write a biography of a Christian and call it screwed. Scrooge is not a name and not a title for a Christian. And yet there are Christians who are Scrooges. Now I am by humbug for Christmas. Christmas is pagan. I am by humbug for Halloween. I am by humbug about church traditions. I am by humbug about simple, easy believism. But to edify and to help and gain for another Christian, I am not by humbug. If God, and he is, right in your story, your biography, as many men and women in the Bible that are recorded for us to read, that there is a biography of Stiley Hayward. If I were to pull an allegory like Pilgrim's Progress, and some of the, some of the parables that Jesus spoke about, what character name would God give me? And you need to ask yourself, too, what, what would God give you as a character? We're going to get a new name in heaven, the Bible says. What if that new name reflects upon your character, your being, as a Christian on this planet called Earth? What would that new name be if it would be who you are today? I can think of some wonderful names that will never meet me. I don't know if faith and love would go for Sally Hayward. But I sure would not want a new name as Dirty Vessel. Useless. Worldly. I don't want their names. Faithful. I'm not faithful. Philemon was. Nor would such an ambassador of Christ be called a miser. Our new name, our character should reflect faithfulness and love, not stinginess and being a grump and stingy. People are trying to get to heaven by helping drunks, drug addict addictors, teen pregnancy. They are doing it without faith in Christ or without the love of the Holy Spirit. Trillions and billions of money are spent into programs today that are not working. These drug programs they got in the schools, they're not working. There are more teenage pregnancies today than there have been not working because you're doing it without God and you're doing it without the Bible it's not going to work you can't set a person out to improve his life and having him think well you're going to fall what is that how about, I can set you forth in your life on Christ Jesus. Built upon the gifts of the Holy Spirit, if you are to do right and do what the Bible says, you will have victory and rewards. And yet there's suffering. There will be trials and tribulations. But in Christ, you still can get the victory. Your love comes not from helping others with drugs. It comes from seeing that soul is going to hell. I can fatten 
a homeless person and give him pork and, and beef and chicken and turkey and potatoes and peas and pies and buffet. I can give that homeless person a lifetime buffet. And yet if I do not give him the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he does not learn what God expects for salvation, he'll just burn that pork and that beef and that vegetables in hell for all eternity. And there'll be no crowns. Now am I saying not feed the homeless, not take care of the drug addict? you got to go in with God and Jesus and the Bible. And if that person is not going to adhere to God, he's not going to listen to Jesus Christ, and he's not going to give heed to the word of God, there will be no success. When that man dies, it ends up in hell. And he can give up the drugs. He can give up the alcohol. He can become a nice, clean man and a CEO of a company and become rich and help others. And yet without God, without Jesus Christ, without the Bible, he will die and burn in hell. And if he gets saved and you gets cleaned by God, by Jesus, by the Bible, the Bible commands him to go in all the world and preach the gospel. Nowhere does it say set up food kitchens, get rid of the drugs, get rid of the poor. Matter of fact, Jesus said you're going to have the poor with you always. And we're to help those that are truly, truly poor. But our main mission is go all the world and preach the gospel. If we have that love, God can use us as proper vessels holy for his service if we're really concerned about the lost man and we're really set upon God Jesus in the word we in turn will keep our lives clean by the blood of Jesus Christ we will look out to what we're doing we will look out to where we're going and be holy acceptable unto God yeah we're all sinners we're all fallen And I don't think it was Philemon who told Paul of his faith and love. Philemon did not walk up to Paul, Paul, you see my faith and love. No, it's been reported by others. And you're not to go out there and blow that trumpet. Look what I'm doing. Look how great I am. No, it is to be reported by others of what you are doing. And probably most of the time that you don't even know what they're saying about you. Yeah, I know they're going to say bad things about you if you're living right. Those are lies. They'll stand before God, but some way, sometime, it's got to say something right. And you don't need to blow your own horn. Because you start blowing your own horn, you start bragging about yourself, then that's a sin. Now, the bowels that are found in verse 7 is not a body function from eating. Trying to be clean. You know, doctors have performed a bowel movement. The waist. And that's not the biblical definition of bowels. Take off the E, you get a bowl. The utensil that, that is, has a hole inside of it to carry, to hold substance. It is not the intestines, neither small or large, the bowels. As far as scripture goes, it's like when you read the word perfect in scripture. That doesn't mean 100%. But you're going at it at your best ability that God's given you. That's the definition of, of perfect in the Bible. But when you look at Webster's 1828 dictionary, it says the interior part of anything 
And it could be used here as you as your or fer, uh, feral Philemon's inward affection. But it says bowels of the saints. So, for we have great joy and consolation, comfort, joy, rest in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. So let's go back to Webster's number one diction, uh, uh, Webster's number one verse uh, definition. The intestines of an animal, the entrails, especially a man, the heart. 2 Corinthians 6.12, by definition number one, we could say that maybe Philemon fed saints of God. Maybe the saints that had no food were and were poor or needed food because of an unseen event. Or just he had a table spread when the saints came by his way. So we're not looking at the bowels of Philemon, we're looking at the saints. And maybe he did feed. And gave substance to saints. And there we would not be wrong. But we're not talking about the extraction of food through waste. We're talking about the stomach has been fed. The heart that's in the bowels of my body. Has been nourished by the nourishment of the food of Philemon to be taken care of. If the heart, 2 Corinthians 6, 12, maybe the hearts of the saints were kept on the Lord, to the Lord, by encouragement of Philemon. Maybe the, the bowels of the saints of their heart inside of them, maybe their heart was strengthened, which is inside the body, to keep going, to keep doing, by Philemon's life, by his words, by his, whatever he done for them. Maybe the life that finally even produced in these saints was the inside their bodies was just not for eat, drink, and be merry, but for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. And that would co coincide with number two, the interior part of anything as the bowels of the earth. It is giving God what is the best part of self, your inside, your heart, your mind, your soul, your inside holds the organs that give you life, such as the heart, the liver, the kidneys, the stomach. Inside that rib cage, inside of you, who you truly are. How does that sound? Let me ask you, Christian. Could Paul write what he just wrote about Philemon? Those words that were penned and once for all, the testimony came not from your mouth, but from others. Do you speak by the actions as a Christian? What does your action say about you? Could Paul write about you what he just wrote about Philemon? Saint, let me ask you a question. What about that Christian over there? What about him? What do you guys say about him? Could that saint say anything near or about what was said about Philemon? Man, you were distraught. You had problems. You were going down. What picked you up? Oh, the words and the comfort of Philemon. Man, he helped me, got me through, and got me right back on Jesus Christ. You look so refreshed. You look so well. You look so good. What happened? Oh, man, I was on my journey. I came to Philemon's house, and he fed me with a good meal and gave me rest that night. And then the next day, he sent me off in God's blessing. We prayed. We talked about God. We fellowshiped in God. It was a wonderful day and night. 
And again, it brings us to verse 1. Oh, wait a minute. I skipped it. We talk about refreshed. Are refreshed by thee, brethren. Again, Webster's 1828 Dictionary. To give new strength to. To relieve after fatigue. Number three. To re revive. To, uh, to look. It's to help after depression. Looks to me that time saints in verse 7 were in trouble. By the definition sought in Webster's 1828 dictionary, there was trials, there was tribulations, as they will fall for all men, but for Christians, the saints. They were given aid, they were given comfort, they were given strength to continue on. Now, the strength we can say, yes. We can go back to eating. Fatigued by no food, no water. Fasted. Paul said fasted and, you know, suffered of, of food and that lack of food, suffering of lack of water. The pearls of Paul. And when I came to find him, he fed me, fleshed, to build up my character. And also it can be that in trials and troubles in, in my heart and the spiritual part of me and the soul part of me was down. It was just ready to give up. Just ready, I just couldn't handle it. And then when I came to find him, he strengthened me. Not of food, but of words, of prayer, of comfort, of being about Jesus Christ. And God is able to use someone else to help you in those things. It's what a pastor is supposed to do. It's what your church brethren is supposed to do. They're supposed to lift you up and help you out of troubles. As you are supposed to be to lift someone and help others out in your church. As they would help you, you help them. Whether physical or spiritual. That the love that Philemon gave. It could have been food. It could have been thoughts, it could have been money, words, whatever it might be. He relieved them of their troubles. And that is not being selfish. But it pleased the saints. It pleased Paul. And it gave comfort to Philemon. And to God and not necessarily in that order. Philemon had not only of love and faith, but he was a refresher. And he, being used by the Holy Ghost, was a comforter to those that were saved. That again brings us to verse 1. Unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. There's the laborer. Refreshing. Helping. The labor was not to the Lord, but it was to the Lord by serving the saints. When Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, why are you persecuting me? Paul never persecuted Jesus. He persecuted the saints. And Jesus Christ is refreshed when Philemon refreshed the, flame, the saints. Now, he didn't labor as a CEO. As a taskmaster, he labored as a Christian to other Christians. It was for God. And why? Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus. What a testimony of a man. God was able to use Philemon to help God's children. And we're talking about a mean, nasty, wicked slave owner, as the world would say. I would read it as a guy who is read and who is adorned and lifted up by God to even have his name among the 66 books of the Bible. So what was the results? 
The saints are refreshed by thee, brother. What a testimony of that man. God was able to use Philemon to help God's children. I must jump ahead of us of the story because Philemon I mean Anasimus. Oh Philemon has a runaway slave called Onassimus. And he, Onassis, is going back to Philemon on Paul's words. Paul's told Onassis, go back to Philemon. Now, Paul is relying on the love and the faithfulness that has been testified to him by the saints. That here is this man who is in crime, who has rebelled against his owner. Who is now saved. Who is now a child of God. And finally you're going to have to refresh this saint now. He's your brother. You are both children of God. So verse 7. This is a saint. Don't mistreat him. But refresh him. With thy love and thy faithfulness. To get things right, do I think finally would would yeah. Do you think finally would have misused or abused Onassimus? No, I don't think so. The testimony that finally even has. And we're not even gonna talk about that runaway slave that's lost. He's not lost. He's saved. Him and Philemon are children of God. They are brothers in the Lord. And you have taken care of the saints, Philemon. Now you've got to take care of this one. And there's no question what if he was lost. I'm talking about Onassis. No, that's no question. No, he's saved. As you have helped other saints, here's a saint. And he has done wrong. All those other people did not do you wrong, Philemon. But this saint has. And you treat this saint just as you treated other saints properly. And as Christ Jesus has forgiven him, so ought you to forgive him. But we are human, and so is Philemon. I think this epistle is written that Paul is pleased with the testimony of Philemon that he would be pleased to learn his runaway slave is now saved. And was in Paul's company. Instead of, oh, Nasmus, I'm going to whip you, I'm going to beat you, and I'm going to sell you off to somebody else. You saved? You been in the company of Paul? Sit down and tell me how he's doing. Sit down and tell me how you got saved. Sit down and let's talk as brothers in God. What a difference! What a different salvation can place in our lives and the decree that we become as children of God. Interesting that it, interesting what is found in the Old Testament, the law. Deuteronomy 23, 15, verse 23, 15, 16. Thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee. He shall dwell with thee, even among you, in that place which he shall choose in one of them gates, where it liketh him best. Thou shalt not oppress him. I know we are under the New Testament, under grace, but as Paul is the writer, there was a protection of a runaway slave in the law. If we were under the law, what Paul is doing with with with, uh, with Oh man, Onassimus is against the law of God in the Old Testament. You are not to send that slave back to his, to his master. You are to establish him somewhere else. But under grace, Paul has got this runaway slave who is now saved as a child of God, and he's sending him back to a child of God. Seeking mercy, grace, faithfulness, and love of Philemon. 
things will get better. It's not you're sending a runaway slave back to an angry slave holder. You are sending a child of God to a child of God to take care of it. That is the reputation, verse 7 of Philemon. I know we are in the New Testament again, but there was a protection of the runaway slave. Now, why is Paul sending that runaway slave back to his master? Verse 21. Having, con having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Having confidence. Paul knows that Philemon will not do him harm. Onassman. That what he will do will please God, Paul, and Onassimus. The Old Testament law was written to protect the runaway slave from his owner. Paul knew or had strong confidence in Philemon and knew that Onassimus would be safe. Once he found out about his new brother in Christ. How's that? See, you don't send that runaway slave back in the law because he might be mistreated. He might be killed. He might be sold. He might be given even worse hard bondage of rigor. Paul's like, no. That is not the character of Philemon. If I send him back there, he's going to get love and care. And he's going to get a church. Verses 1 and 2, the church that's in your house, Philemon, he will invite Onassimus in his living room. Oh my God, we're going to have a living room church service. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I'd like to have you introduce to you Onassimus. He was one of my slaves. And now he's a child of God, and he's been with the Apostle Paul. And maybe I give him a testimony if you speak to all about how Paul's doing and what's going on with Paul's life as we welcome to our living room church service. Er. Paul has confidence in this Christian name, Philemon. Look at the Bible. What it comes. Look at the Bible when it comes to runaway slaves or servants. Genesis 16, you find the story of Agar, the Egyptian handmaid. Now, she's not really a, a, a slave. She's a servant. But after she and Abraham had, had produced a child, when Sarai dwelt hardly with her, she fled from her face, from Sarai's face. She ran away. And we are not told the story of the Nasses, whether it was right or wrong. Hagar ran because Sarah was mistreating her. Now, some assume that Onassis stole money, but I don't, I don't see that here. We'll study that out. Cruelty. Hagar leaves. And she doesn't get far at all. And the angel of the Lord sent her. The first time the angel of the Lord shows up in Genesis 16, he shows up to Hagar at a fountain of water. John chapter 4. And he says unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. The angel of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ before his human form. Jesus Christ, through the angel of the Lord, told Hagar to return and submit. Just as Paul is doing to Onassimus. Now, how was Hagar treated by Sarai after? We're not told. We are told that she blesses God, gives the name to, to honor God that seeth her. And then next thing you know, she has the baby. And Abraham was 99, something like that, years old when he bared and named the child Ishmael. That was before the law too, you know. The law didn't come to Exodus 20. And the law left man when Christ came out of that tomb alive and well. Very important that would be the very important thing for Onassimus to do. Return and submit to Philemon. As hard as going to say, and I, I don't think it, uh, he is Philemon's property. And that's the number two reason why Paul is saying, you go back to Philemon. 
He owns you. He paid for you. And we get the greatest example of that in the book of Corinthians, that we are not our own. We are bought with a price by the blood of God, Jesus Christ. Acts 20, 28, purchased by God. We are not our own. We belong to God, and we got to get back to God and get out of the world. Philemon pitches me. Before I was saved, I was a runaway slave running away from God. Now that I'm saved, i got to get back to God and submit to God. As you will see later, we study, Lord willing, Paul has full confidence, verse 21, that Philemon will do the right thing. Hoping it will be that Onassis may be returned to Paul, we'll read later, for the service of Jesus Christ, verse 13. Paul is telling Onassis, I'll give you a little bit, a little bit later details right now. Paul is sending Onassis back to Philemon because he believes in Philemon and he's Philemon's property, and yet he's going to ask Philemon in this letter, after he comes back to you and gets things right, can you send him back to me for the work of the ministry? Why not, Paul, just keep him? Why not? Because you lose the wonderful story of a sinner coming before God, the sinner, Onassimus, God, Philemon, you've got to come to God and confess your faults, your sins, and have God forgive you your sins by the blood of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried, and arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You've got to appear before God to be saved. And once you appear before God and you're saved by Jesus Christ, then you go back to Christians and you serve God with other Christians. But you can't just go hang around with Paul and say, Oh, I'm saved and you've never been to God. you got to get things right. I'm going to tell you another story about Onassis that applies in my life. I was saved April 21st, 1987. April 22nd, I told my dad about hell. I witnessed to him. He's not saved. I don't know how long a time after that was, but I sat down and I wrote my dad a letter. I knew my dad knew, but I said, Dad, I stole money from you. I have no idea how much I stole from you. But if you were to give me a number right now, a, a, a money amount right now, I will somehow, within my time, I will make up that money I stole from you. I wrote that down in a letter. I went to my dad, finally, and I said, listen, I'm saved now. I'm a Christian. I've got to do right by God. And one of the things i got to do is I've got to get right with you, Dad. Even though you're lost. Doesn't, doesn't match this story. But I was nasty. I went to my dad and I said, hey, this is my crime against you. And I went, I went to my mother and I hurt my mother as a boy growing up. I gave her many tears. I gave her many heartaches. I was a sinner just being a son to my mother. I went to my mom one time and I apologized to her. I said, "Mom, I'm I'm sorry. She was sick. she was lost. She was a she was a sinner." And before my wife went home to glory, my mom got saved. And after my wife died in, in September of 2010, about a week or two weeks after that, I realized I was sitting down talking to my mom. We were talking about Jesus. We were talking about heaven. We were talking about the Bible. And this dawn of his mom, I just realized, you got saved, didn't you? She says, yes. My mom has MS right now, and she wants to go home in God's time. Christian, 
if you got a door that is closed and behind that door you've got people that you've hurt that you have suffered to that you have done wrong to you need to take that door open it up one by one you need to get right with people Jesus gave a, a proper illustration that you know before you bring your offering go get right with the person that you've wronged and that's what's happening with Onassis. That is what Paul is settling with Onassis between Philemon. You get it right. And if you get it right, oh, Philemon, will you send him back to me? That's the hardest part. I've had a pastor. He did me wrong twice. And maybe, I don't know if there was any wrong by me, it probably is, but I have written that pastor twice and told him, whatever faults I have done, I ask that he forgive me. I believe the first one, I didn't do nothing. I was just innocent, new, really newborn babe in Christ. And that guy has sent letters back to me, screaming and hollering at me in, in, in his, you know, ivory tower. How dare, you know. I tried to get right with that one. But he didn't want me. He, he forget, you know, when somebody comes to you and asks for forgiveness, you're supposed to forgive 70 times 7, but he won't. But I tried to make that avenue straight. And that avenue has become a dead end. For him, not for me. There were times that, you know, I was concerned. Hey, I, maybe I've done wrong. Maybe i got to get it right. And I've done what I was supposed to do. But if you got somebody in your life that you've done wrong to, a letter, a telephone call, a visit, you got to make it right. And I'll tell you something else after you get right, before you get it right, or after you get it right, whatever they, they forgive you, whether they don't forgive you, you got to go to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can imagine. Onassis coming finally in and telling him about how he got saved. That's going to world preach the gospel. That's his own testimony. That's some of the things I do in street ministry. I will just give my testimony. I had a guy a couple weeks ago. He wouldn't even let me give my testimony. He stopped me. I wish the Holy Spirit would, re would have recorded what happened when Onassis came to finally him. That would have been wonderful. At first, was it anger? Then the letter is handed over and read and result in tears. Did Onassis know what this letter said? Was it a sealed letter? And look at the different lot of Uriah and David's letter to Joab. Uriah held a letter saying, put this guy in the hottest bottle and kill him. Onassis hand this letter to Philemon. He's saved. He's your brother. There must have been a hail of hallelujahs, amens, tears, and joy that afternoon or morning when Onassis came before Philemon. May have been anger in the beginning. Hey, we're all sinners. Like when he get when he when we get home to God with a letter, and what is that letter recorded? More than verily, verily, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Not as that quote, but the inscription on the cross that began my salvation. It's not my king. It's the king of the Jews. But that's the one that died on the cross for me. And I carry that letter to God, Philemon, and say, I'm coming home on the merit of your son, who, who is you. Finished by the angel's word, he is not here. He is risen. That's the gospel. Jesus died. Not only so, they buried him and he arose. What happens now? Philemon has a servant that saved, that is a worker. That's what Paul's, Paul's going to say. And we're going to stop right there. <laughs> what a place to stop. Get you catch up next week. We learn more about Onassimus. Coming home to find him. What a wonderful thing.